there are many disruptive changes happening around you, okay? The first speaker mentioned four or five of them. There's lots of them, demographic changes, technological changes, society changes, cultural changes, lots of them. And what I found when I work with companies is that when you make a laundry list of all these changes, people get scared, they get paralyzed. They say, my God, how am I gonna respond to all these changes? And I found from experience that the best way to think about that question is to break up the challenge into individual challenges. If you ask me, how can I respond to all these challenges at the same time? I don't know. I hope you don't know either. You know, you got hit by 20 things at the same time. How do I respond? I don't know. But if we take one by one, maybe you can think of some answers. So for example, if you, if you are worried in your business about disruptive technologies, let's think about that. How can I respond or exploit disruptive technologies? If you are worried about demographic changes, the aging population, the fact that the people will now, uh, a baby born today has a 30% chance of living 100 years. That's a major change that's gonna happen in our society, and you're worried in your business, let's think about that. So let's take one by one. The first lesson, and I always like to start with this one because it's a soft little thing, and people, in a gut-filled way, you say, yeah, well, I can relate to it, but they don't appreciate how important that is. Attitude, how do you approach the disruption? How do you look at it? How do you frame it to your organization? Plays a big role. And let me be specific as to what do I mean. I'll give you a, an academic study. This is uh, the PhD thesis of a gentleman called Clark Gilbert. This guy was a PhD student at Harvard Business School, and he spent four years of his life to do a PhD thesis on what? On how the newspaper companies in the United States responded to the internet, okay? Anybody from the newspaper business? Nobody from the, okay. You know what's happening in the newspaper business. How many of you still buy paper newspapers? Don't tell your children, huh? <laughs> it's a dying breed, I don't have to tell you. Online has come on and it's really disruptive, this industry. So the question is, that this guy was interested in is, how did the newspapers companies respond to this disruptive new business model, online distribution? And more importantly, why is it that some newspaper companies responded to the internet really well and some did not? Here in Europe, for example, the best responder to the internet in the newspaper business has been the German company Access Springle. If you don't believe me, go and look at what they've done, this guy. It's an amazing transformation moving into the digital. But there are many people who did not do it well. So what is the difference? This guy, he spent four years at Harvard testing hypothesis after hypothesis, and he could not find an explanation why is it that some are successful and some have failed. And finally, after four years, he got lucky. He got lucky in that he looked at one variable. And what he found was that this variable could explain the difference between success and failure. And what was the variable? Very simple. He looked at the people that failed in their response. What did they do? They looked at online distribution of news, and what did they say? They said, my God, this online distribution of news is such a big threat to our business. It's cannibalizing the newspaper business. We need to do something. And whatever they did afterward ended up in failure. Whatever strategy they developed after they started looking at it as a threat ended up in failure. Now, you may be thinking, ah, I think I know who was successful then. If I were to ask you which companies were the successful ones, what would you say? Open-minded, but they were not open-minded, these guys. The, the, the ones that didn't? Didn't look at failure, yeah. Courage, but these guys, they didn't look at... Opportunity, yes. Who said opportunity? You know, usually when you say that those that failed, they looked at it as a threat, whereas those that succeeded, how did they look at it? People say, that's an opportunity. No, that's the amazing thing. That's not what he found. The people who were successful did not look at it as an opportunity. How did they look at it then? Well, <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it? Shall I tell you what he found, this guy? And he got a PhD for this? <laughs> at Harvard? <laughs> Those that succeeded, they started saying, my God, this is a big threat to our business. We need to do something. 
Can you tell the difference between those that fail? No, they said the same thing. But there is a difference, guys. There is a difference. The difference was that they started out framing it as a threat. And then over time, they turned around and they said, you know, it's a big threat, but it's also a big opportunity for us. In other words, what's the difference? The successful ones, they were able to look at the thing as both a threat and an opportunity. It's not a threat. It's not an opportunity. It's a threat and an opportunity. You are all sitting there saying, what kind of academic BS is this? <laughs> Isn't it? He got a PhD for that? Yes, he did. Because it challenges everything we thought that we knew of. It challenges what your mother told you. You remember when you were growing up, your mother would look at me and say, my son, this glass, it's not half empty. It's half full. Did your mother tell you that? Well, she goes wrong. It's not half full. What is it? It's half empty and half full. <laughs> right. Now you say, why is that, Corsa? Let's look into the psychology, and then maybe you'll appreciate why this is such an important finding. To make my point, let's think of an analogy. How many of you have been to Africa on safari? You've been on safari? Yeah, I need a lady at the front. Been on safari? Yeah. Good time. Did you see the lions? Yeah, big animals and so on. Yeah. Imagine the following. You're on safari. Beautiful sunny day. You're having a jolly good time. It's lunchtime. You take a break. You sit by your jeep, having your sandwich, champagne, jazz music in the background. Yeah. Are you very relaxed? <laughs> and then suddenly, out of nowhere, ah, this lion is about to pounce on you. Out of nowhere. Out of nowhere. You know, the lion is about to attack you. You have five seconds to live. And my question to you is the following. The lion is like this. Ah! My question to you is, how do you look at the lion? As a threat or as an opportunity? <laughs> <laughs> how would you look at it? How many of us would say, wow, Simba, let's take a photograph of it. <laughs> we'll never, we look at it as a threat. We say, oh, shit, oh, my God, oh, my God. You know. And the moment the human body sees something as a real threat, Something wonderful happens. What happens to us? When you're scared, what happens? Do you wake up? Does it create a sense of urgency? Or do you sit there and say, okay, let me finish the sandwich and then I'm going <laughs> to... Does it galvanize resources like, my God, my God, I need to do something? You see, we know from psychology research that when human beings frame something as a threat, a real threat, lots of wonderful things happen to us. We wake up, it creates a sense of urgency, it galvanizes resources, it mobilizes resources, it galvanizes people, and so on. It gets us ready to face the danger. This is wonderful. But I don't have to tell you that along with the positives come certain negatives. And what is the negative? You woke up, you're ready for action, the lion is about to attack you, what do you do? What? <laughs> what do human beings do? What, what do you do? Ah! We run. Yeah, kill it. Do we think about it? Do you think about Do you say there's a way, Damien? Let's think about this strategically now, you know. One possible response I have is I run. Another one is I don't run. I take a knife and I attack the lion and fight with it. Another possibility is I don't run, I don't fight. I pick my wife, throw her to the lion, and then run. <laughs> I'm not suggesting that's a real <laughs> You see what I mean? We don't think. Human beings, when you put them under threat, yes, they are galvanized, ready for action, but what do they do? They don't think. They run. They panic. We, t we become very short-term oriented. I could go on here, but you get my point. When we frame something as a threat, something good happens, something bad happens. And the same thing happens when we frame something as an opportunity. When we see something as an opportunity, we think about it strategically, long-term, we analyze and so on, we develop a long-term strategy. But something bad also happens, which is what? There's no urgency to do anything. We sit there, we analyze the situation and say, yes, we need to respond to the internet like this, and we have all these wonderful ideas. But we say, we need to respond. Who's we? What happens when people mention the word we? Have you heard them say that in your companies? 
you stand in front of them and say, we need to change the culture in this place. We need to get out of our silos and be creative. Have you, have you heard people say that? Yeah? What do they mean when they say we? They mean you, yes. And of course, you sit there and you agree with them. So, yeah, I agree. We really must do this. Who do you mean? Them, yes. They mean you, you mean them, and who ends up doing anything? No one. No sense of urgency, you see. So this is the major discovery of this guy. The major discovery of this guy in the newspaper business is he says, he said, look, if you just frame it as a threat, okay, it creates a sense of urgency, but it's not enough. People need the time to think strategically. How do you do it? Frame it as a threat to create the sense of urgency, but also as an opportunity. It has to be as both. You cannot have one without the other. You know, that's why I always tell people, whenever they say, have you heard this saying that to get action in an organization, you have to create a burning platform? Have you heard that? Have you heard, you need to create? Have you been on a burning platform yourself? What happens on a burning platform? Panic. Everybody's jumping. Are they all jumping in a nice orchestrated way, one after the other, towards the vision? Of course not. A burning platform is my threat analogy. It creates a sense of urgency, but then what? Disjointed short-term action where everybody does the, the thing for themselves. It's not enough to have a burning platform. It's not enough to see something as a threat. You have to see it as a threat and as an opportunity. It sounds easy, but you'll see in a moment why it's so difficult. 